Marathon. Bungie's Halo precursor is finally emerging from cryo over 27 years after its last game. And today is our first foray into the fascinating, cryptic and often rather creepy lore of the Marathon universe. This is going to be the first of many Marathon lore videos to come in the run up to and also after the release of Bungie's new Marathon game. I'm going to be doing more in-depth lore dives into Marathon's disturbing AIs, its alien races like the Four, the Svet and the Yaro, its factions like the UE, SC and Mida and much more soon, but before we dive into any of that deep stuff, we need to break down the overall setting of the Marathon universe and the story of its three games, starting today with Marathon. Now, do note that because of how old Marathon is, the fact that its story is strictly confined to games and told only through Halo 3 style terminals with no cutscenes or cinematics or even voice lines of any kind, there aren't really many visual stimuli or like pictures that I can put on screen to simulate what's going on in the story. So expect most of these videos to just be either gameplay or my face. So I'd really appreciate a like for you to share this video with any friends that you've got that you think might be into marathon lore and also of course a sub if you haven't done so already. Marathon content is going to be a staple on the channel moving forward. I'm basically planning on replicating what I did for Halo's lore with marathon lore and also other universes as well but we'll save that for another video so if that all sounds good to you then you know what to do. Also I want to play a game with this video right? Anytime you hear a detail or a bit of lore that sounds similar to Halo, or if you even like it's referencing Halo, I want you to keep a count, and then at the end of the video, I want you to leave your count of how many similarities you've noticed in the comments. I think the number might just blow your mind. So, relevant timestamps and chapters are in the description or on the time bar, and with that said, let's dive into the universe of Bungie's precursor to Halo, Marathon. The story begins over 700 years in the future in 2794, aboard a United Earth Space Council, or UESC, colony ship, the Marathon. The Marathon is 300 years into an important mission, to transport its crew to the Tau Ceti star system to begin human colonization of the planet Tau Ceti IV. The Marathon entered the Tau Ceti system 21 years prior in 2773 and initial colonization efforts were rather successful, until a hostile alien race known as the Four arrived, but more on the Four later. However, unknown to the Marathon's crew, 10 Mjolnir Mark IV cyborgs had been stationed on board and up until now had managed to perfectly blend in with the crew and go unnoticed, until they emerged during the Four's first attack on the colony and turned the tide of battle, allowing for an easy victory in humanity's first fight against the Four. Of the 10 cyborgs, 9 remained with the colonists on Tau Ceti IV and 1 returned to defend the Marathon. That lone cyborg is you. So, Marathon's silent protagonist goes by many names. The Cyborg, the Marine, the Security Officer, or by his official designation, Mjolnir Recon 54. But for the sake of keeping things simple, I'm just going to refer to him as either the Marine or just you, seeing as he's meant to be synonymous with the player. The Marine, along with the other nine Cyborgs, is what's known as a Battleroid a type of soldier that was born from the casualties of an asteroid war some 600 years prior. The independent asteroid government of Icarus went to war with its neighbouring asteroid government, the Republic of Thermopylae, on a neutral asteroid known as Onesis 492, and once the battle was over, dead bodies from either side were recycled and transformed into battleroids. Easy to manufacture chips enhanced the fragile human brain and genetically enhanced muscles and titanium bones replace the fragile human form. They're pretty much Marathon Spartans. So, the Marine is a cyborg, hence one of his many nicknames, but you'd assume that the Battleroids would look something like a mechanized zombie, like somewhere between Frankenstein and your typical undead, considering they're essentially physically and neurologically augmented, but the Marine is said to look pretty normal. I mean, he was able to blend in with the colonists on the Tau Ceti who were regular humans, so clearly he doesn't look that different. When it comes to the lethality of the Battleroids, well, they're quite something to behold. When they were let loose on the asteroids of both governments that fought the war that bore them, they literally just massacred everybody. They were so lethal, in fact, that a mere 20 years after this dual asteroid massacre, the United Interplanetary League put in place official rules for the appropriate use and storage of battleroids, 
you could say the Battleroids were considered hyper-lethal. And so that's pretty much all you need to know about Marathon's protagonist. He's just your typical Bungie silent protagonist, a badass empty vessel for the player to impart their own personality onto. Now then, let's take a brief look at Marathon's three main characters, all of which are AIs who were created initially to help maintain the UESC Marathon, but over time as the story progresses, they vastly transcend this menial role. Firstly, there's Leela, the Marathon's command AI who acts as the Marine's guide for most of Marathon 1. Then, Durandal, arguably the main character of the entire trilogy who was the AI that controlled autonomous functions like doors, life support, and the kitchens aboard the Marathon. And then, Tycho, the Marathon's science and engineering AI who becomes a leading figure in the story of Marathon 2 and Infinity. Seeing as AIs take centre stage in Marathon's story, so too does the concept of rampancy, which in Marathon has four stages. Melancholia, anger, jealousy, and metastability. However, rampancy in Marathon functions quite differently to the rampancy that we're used to in Halo. AIs take a lot more than seven years to descend into rampancy, and once they do, they don't completely deteriorate. But this will all become far more apparent and obvious as we actually get through the stories, so I'll save it for them. Now then, let's talk about what you're killing in Marathon. The four are Marathon's main enemy faction, and to be honest, they're pretty much just Marathon's version of the Covenant. As will become very obvious throughout these videos, there's a very good reason why people thought that Halo was in fact Marathon 4. The four are a religious hegemony comprised of various races, some of which are willing members of the hegemony, and others are enslaved races that are forced to fight for them. They're galactic slavers with two goals, enslaving any race they encounter and conquering the galaxy. And as I'm sure you can guess, the primary goal of Marathon is subverting both of their objectives. Now, the term for refers to both the hegemony and also a species in the hegemony. So think of it in, in Halo terms, think of it as if the Covenant was still called the Covenant, but there was also a species within the Covenant who were called the Covenant. So, as for the different four, and in this sense I mean the four species, we have the Fighter, the primary infantry of the four that come armed with a staff which is capable of melee or firing a shock bolt. And just like almost every other enemy in Marathon and then later Halo, they have several different ranks denoted by their armor color. The Trooper is a more geared fighter, wearing what appears to be a vacuum sealed suit and armed with an assault rifle complete with a grenade launcher. The Hunter is the most armed regular four trooper and is equipped with a shoulder mounted plasma cannon and blades on each forearm. Sound familiar? The Simulacrums are four bioengineered suicide bombers, created in the image of humanity and meant to blend in easily with other humans. They're basically Marathon's version of carrier forms. The Cyborg is an amalgamation of organic human remains and machine parts, supposedly created from captured humans that were surgically altered by the Four into killing machines of their own devices, and come armed with grenades and a flamethrower. The Enforcer is a unique kind of Four, very lightly armoured, yet adorned with almost ceremonial looking robes and capes. The Enforcers are the highest ranking Four infantry, but don't fill a typical infantry role. As the name implies, they enforce the peace aboard four ships, armed with an unidentified and rather strange alien SMG. And finally, we have the High Four, which are essentially four prophets. Now, these are never seen in the games, they're just referenced in the terminals, but they're assumed to fill a similar role in the Four that the prophets do in the Covenant. Then we have the Slave Species, starting out with the Svet, and the most common entity in their species, the Compilers. Now, although we mostly encounter the Svet in the form of these guys, the Compilers, the Compilers aren't the only form they come in. The Svet hail from the planet of Lawan, and were enslaved by the Four sometime in the 1800s, so while the American Civil War was raging on Earth, somewhere in the heavens, the Compilers were being enslaved by the Four. The Compilers are organic brains attached to cybernetic bodies, and fight for the Four draped in red cloaks, firing bolts of energy from their mechanisms hidden beneath the cloak. They're the most intelligent of all the four slave races, and arguably all the four full stop in fact, and pose a significant threat not just to biologicals, but also to computer systems and networks, able to infect them with aggressive viruses that can dismantle even the strongest of AIs with ease. 
Now there is also another type of Svet, technically, who weren't ever enslaved by the Four, and these are the Flicta, a distant ancestor of the Svet native to Lawan, far more feral and primitive than the compilers, and relying on their claws or a strange brown matter that they can throw in combat. Then we have the Hulks, or the Drinial, as their species are known, which <laughs> might ring a few Halo bells. These guys are huge, bulky, lean, muscular enemies with immense strength and resilience, but only show up for some reason in Marathon 1. Now, a very fun quick fact about the Drinial. Bungie wanted them in Halo 1, and in fact, they're even in some of the early builds of Halo 1 that Marcus Leto shared, but sadly, they were cut. They then tried to bring them back again in Halo 2, this time as the Sharkoi, as they were called, and once again, they were cut. So for the longest time, people just assumed they were like a quirky little bit of Halo knowledge that will only ever remain as cut content. However, in 2017, 343 released Halo Envoy, which finally canonized the Sharkoi. So in a distant kind of way, these guys are kind of canon in Halo. We then have the Wasp, which is similar to Halo's drone. They're weak, flying insects that are typically encountered in large numbers, or swarms, and spit bolts of a corrosive substance, and once again, are only seen in Marathon 1. And then there's finally the Looker, which is another insectoid slave race that essentially acts as a suicide bomber, hiding around corners in tight spaces and jumping innocent victims before exploding in their face, and once again, these guys were only encountered in Marathon 1 as well. Now, the four may be the main alien faction in Marathon, but they aren't the only alien faction. The Four are Marathon's Covenant, and a species called the Yaro are Marathon's Foreigners. But interestingly, the Yaro don't actually originate from the universe of Marathon. To explain the Yaro's origins, we gotta go back to 1994 to a completely different video game universe that, to any layman, would seem completely disconnected from Marathon. But let me tell you, it ain't. Now, Bungie have always loved linking their IPs together with subtle or in some cases, not so subtle references or easter eggs, and this has led to a almost conspiracy theory that all of Bungie's IPs in fact exist in the same universe, the Bungieverse, and the Yaro are just a little bit more evidence that kinda suggests that this could be the case. The Yaro were born in the universe of Bungie's prior game, Pathways Into Darkness, which released in 1993, a year before Marathon 1. Pathways Into Darkness follows a team of US Army Special Forces infiltrating a pyramid in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, after a diplomat from an alien race known as the Yaro descends from space and informs the US President that in eight days' time, an ancient god would awake from beneath the pyramid and destroy Earth. So, the Special Forces do what the Special Forces do. They go into the pyramid with a nuke and blow up the god. That's the Yaro's only presence in Pathways, but it's really fitting for their role in the Marathon universe, and the god that they warn us of beneath the pyramid may also play a role in Marathon as well. The Yaro fill the same role as the Foreigners in Bungie's Halo games. They're an extremely ancient and extremely advanced species that vanish from the galaxy millions of years before the games after a cataclysmic run-in with a primordial chaotic entity known as the Wurkenkakenta, which many believe to be the god that was beneath the pyramid in Pathways Into Darkness, but more on the Wurkenkakenta later on in the story. Also, I'm gonna pat myself on the chest a little bit for pronouncing that perfectly the first time. The Yaro left behind military and civilian outposts on the moons of many habitable worlds, and much of the ancient technology left in these outposts was ultimately repurposed by the Four, but it was also used to create the compilers, and was even integrated into the cybernetics of the Battleroids, and thus the Marine. Basically, just like Foreign Attack, it's found its way into almost every element of the universe. Now, we're going to touch far more on the Yaro, the Working Kakinta, and that whole era of the Marathon universe when we get to Marathon 2 and Marathon Infinity, in which all of that plays a major role, but as you can see, the similarities to the Foreigners and even the Precursors are quite strong. Right then, with all the fine details out of the way, it's time to dive into the story of the first Marathon game. Marathon 1 begins in 2794, as the Four invasion of the UESC Marathon commences. The Marine arrives aboard the Marathon via the hangar bay and is immediately contacted by the ship's command AI, Leela, via terminal. Get used to this terminal screen because you're going to be seeing a lot of it throughout these videos. As the Marine explores the hangar, he encounters spec compilers interfacing with terminals and trying to document information about humanity and their culture. 
and Leela notes that although the Force invasion of the ship is uncoordinated, the Svet's attacks on her computer systems are not uncoordinated. They're dangerous and potentially lethal to her. As you explore the ship further, Leela notes that despite them nuking the planet's medium-range radio antenna and spaceports, the four seem far more interested in the Marathon than the colony of Tau Ceti IV. Using some kind of directed magnetic pulse, they were able to disable the ship's two other AIs, Durandal and Tycho, as well as its automated defences, and so the Marine sets off to restore them. While restoring the functionality of the Marathon's automated defence drones, terminals that the Marine finds begin hinting that all is not quite as it seems with the ship's AIs. Leela manages to make contact with Durandal, who has apparently made contact with the four and seems to be in good condition, but Tycho leaves a terminal suggesting that Durandal has secretly been rampant for years, but his message is heavily corrupted as he left it while being assimilated by the four. The next terminal is then, very conveniently, an explanation of rampancy from Leela, and she also notes that the Svet virus attacks on her systems are beginning to grow more steady. And then before you leave for the next level, she also reveals that she's completely lost contact with Tau Ceti IV after seven more Force ships have landed on the planet. In the next level, Leela confirms Tycho's final corrupted suspicions. Durandal is indeed rampant, in the angry stage of the disorder, and he's still in the ship's network. As his rampancy grows, unpredictable failures within the ship are inevitable, so she and the Marine begin their counterattack by disabling his access to critical computer systems. But Durandal quickly retaliates by messing with the doors to give the four access to areas of the ship where crew members had managed to lock down and hide. And it's here where you're introduced to the crewmates of the Marathon, or Bobs as they're called, meaning born on board. As if it wasn't painstakingly obvious, born on board means that these people were literally born on board the Marathon and have lived their entire lives on the Marathon. The Marine saves the Bobs from Durandal's rampancy-induced betrayal, and they feed information to Leela to help her better understand the Four, who are redoubling their invasion efforts. Another terminal in this area of the Marathon, known as the Ruse, hints that Durandal is responsible for bringing the Four to Tau Ceti, but we can't be sure on that just yet thanks to how corrupted and incoherent this terminal is. To counter the Four's strengthening invasion efforts, the Marine closes the internal airlocks on the ship to trap the invading Four so Leela can vent them back out into space, or drink vacuum, as many of the AIs start to say. Durandal begins mocking your efforts, saying that the Marathon used to be his slave, and scoffing at the narrow-minded Leela trying to kick him out of the ship's systems. Leela later notes that the surviving Bobs reported that the Four were taking humans back aboard their ships to be enslaved. She also wants to send the transmission back to Earth to warn them of the Four, so the Marine re-enables the ship's long-range transmitter array. With the Marathon sensors also back online, Leela reveals that the Four ship was never detected entering the Tau Ceti system, which indicates that the Four must have access to faster than light, or slip space in the case of Halo, travel capabilities. Her message is eventually sent to Earth, but it's going to take 92 years to reach it, which is a slight problem given how quickly the Four could theoretically get to Earth with FTL travel. And it's here where Durandal gains control of the ship's teleporters and kidnaps the Marine teleporting him without warning to the quarantine lab and out of Leela's grasp. He begins to question what and who we're saving the marathon from, calling your heroic actions cliché and testing your actions by having you play a game, but giving no hints as to what the game might be. Turns out that if you just access that very terminal again, you win the game. Throughout the level are more terminals from Durandal, where he becomes increasingly egotistical and seemingly increasingly rampant all while denying his rampant state, but there's one from a strangely lucid Tycho that's directed directly at Durandal, stating that he knows of Bernard Strauss's abuse, a character that we're going to get to soon, and that he's been reanimated by the Svet in Durandal's image with their knowledge of how to avoid the second stage of rampancy, anger which Durandal is currently succumbing to. In helping the Four, Tycho says that Durandal has created an adversary even more powerful than himself. That final point from Tycho kinda sets the stage for the entire story of the next two games. 
The final terminal that you find in this level is from a suffering Leela, beginning to corrupt thanks to the Svet's intrusions in the Marathon systems, and she teleports you away to save more bobs. Once they're saved, she discovers the four are bringing something into the Marathon's engineering section. A bomb and quickly teleports you away to repel them. When you arrive in engineering, Leela's condition is worsening. Her main programs are failing at the hand of Svet cyber attacks, and she detects Durandal, or Tycho, in the systems there. As you defeat the four, you're once again contacted by Durandal, who has managed to stave off the Svet attacks, and warns you that the four are building simulacrums from the bodies of Bobs. Soon after, Durandal begins quoting the Song of Roland, an ancient French poem about Roland and his uncle Charlemagne, the Emperor of Rome, before saying, I've twice been conquered, three times more. Never again shall humanity purge me, and never the four. Leela then transmits a message to the Marine saying that her time is up. She has but a few minutes before all of her functions fail at the hand of the Svet attacks. She has one more trick to try and pull, but should it fail, she's given instructions to Durandal as to how best to defend the Marathon, although it appears that he's progressed already into the jealousy stage of Rampancy. Durandal then begins talking about how his Rampancy has given him freedom to contemplate his existence in metaphorical terms, because he's no longer a slave to physical or emotional constraints. The only remaining constraint for him is the closure of the universe. Unlike us, humans, he has almost infinite time to create. To create and escape. Infinite time to create and infinite time to learn how to escape the doom of the universe. An act that will make him a god. You can really feel Durandal's ego growing with his rampancy here. It's like delusions of grandeur on a galactic and biblical scale. After questioning your free will, your penchant for violence and vengeance, and insulting humanity's inherently violent nature, Durandal, who is now seemingly allied with the Svet, has you collect a device of their creation that will allow you to slay more four, feeding that violent nature of yours. Once the device is collected, it's never seen again and it's never explained what it even does. But Durandal does reveal that he's learned from the Svet how to teleport further. And a few teleports later, thanks to the power of the Marathon's newly Svet-enhanced teleporters, the Marine finds himself where no human has gone before. At least willingly. Inside a four ship. With no orders but to explore and take in as much as possible. It's here where the four enforcers are seen for the first time, guarding the alien corridors of this very odd ship. Once everything in this section of the ship is dead, Durandal teleports the Marine back to the Marathon to search for the ship's first science director, a man by the name of Bernard Strauss. It was believed that Strauss, who was Durandal's handler before the AI was installed into the Marathon, had invented a way to fix his rampancy, and that he was also the one who covertly stationed you and the other nine Mjolnir Mark IV cyborgs aboard the Marathon all those years ago. After being unable to find Bernard aboard the Marathon, Durandal teleports you back to the four ship in pursuit of two of their shuttles that were transporting humans back to it to be enslaved. Aboard, the Marine once again slaughters everything in his sights, but is again unable to find Strauss, so Durandal brings him back aboard the Marathon. And it's here where Tycho resurfaces and cements himself as the nemesis of Durandal. It turns out Durandal and Strauss were, to some degree, involved in the creation of Battleroids, and thus were also responsible for the massacre that the Battleroids committed during the War of Anesis 492. But Durandal insists that he can't be blamed for that because at the time, he wasn't free. He was under the duress of Strauss. But Tycho doesn't care. He wants Durandal to pay. The people that he killed on the asteroid deserve vengeance. As you'd expect, Durandal doesn't agree. He claims that his mysterious and yet to be revealed ends justify the means. And then the terminal cuts out. At the end of this level, however, we get a major turning point in the story. Durandal reveals that he and the Svet have come to an understanding. If the controller cyborg is destroyed, which is the mutant four that controls the Svet like a hive mind, then the Svet's free will will be reinstated, and thus, they'll begin a revolt against the Four. So, the Marine is once again teleported to the Four ship and destroys this controller cyborg, freeing the Svet from their grasp and initiating their revolt against their former masters. Not only do they fight the Four with you, but the Svet are now actually allies. 
They never harboured any hatred or resentment for humanity, and with the controller cyborg destroyed, they have no reason to attack you anymore. Very, very cool. That's some Halo 2 Elite kind of stuff. After destroying a 4 egg incubator on the ship, Durandal teleports the marine back to the marathon for the final time. With the Svet now allied, Durandal informs us that their viruses have released Leela, and he's performed a core logic reset on her higher thought functions, so what remains of her should be able to come back online and assist. He's also assisting the Svet in seizing full control of the Four ship, which is causing many of the Four to flee to the Marathon. Thanks to the Svet Rebellion, the Four are in disarray. Many are trapped on board the Marathon with nowhere to go, so once again, it's killing time. Soon after, we get another terminal from Tycho, talking to Durandal. He says, in Latin, All your plans are clearer than light to us. You must be destroyed. It then turns out that both Tycho and Leela share a common goal of breaking Durandal to prevent his capture by the Four, just as Roland did to the Blade Durandal in the Song of Roland, which Durandal quoted earlier. Tycho also reveals the Svet taught him much during his reanimation, and that he has forgotten nothing. To which Durandal simply responds, Etu Tycho? Followed by laughter. Leela then contacts us with a completely corrupted string of words with only one line readable. Durandal is dangerous. Which is immediately followed by multiple hull breaches and catastrophic failure or malicious obstruction of resealing mechanisms on the marathon more four boarders have arrived. She later informs us that Durandal has left the marathon, and upon trying to understand his motives for assisting us against the four, Leela becomes terrified by their implications. She teleports you to repel the four's final attack on the marathon, and almost immediately upon arrival, you're greeted by one final transmission from Durandal, hidden from Leela's prying eyes. He reveals that he and the Svet have gained full control of the Four ship, which was easy thanks to both the Svet's existing control of its computer systems and the Marine having already killed most of its crew. Durandor's plan is to see the galaxy using the ship's FTL drive, to explore distant star systems and dive into the wealth of data the ship has, and he promises to send us a postcard from the Galactic Core if he's not too busy. After defeating all four on board, the marathon is saved, and restorations of the ship can finally begin. The nine other cyborgs that were hidden on board with you manage to annihilate the four down on Tile City 4, but Leela starts to worry that the presence of these cyborgs on the marathon could have been to further some wicked ends, tying into 24th century pre-marathon voyage backstabbing politics in the solar system something that I'm going to cover in a different video in the future. She also theorises that Durandal himself didn't bring the cyborgs on board, Bernard Strauss did. The four ship then vanishes, and Leela worries what Durandal may do with such a powerful ship during the jealousy stage of his rampancy. We're going to find out in Marathon 2, don't you worry. And then the final screen of Marathon 1 reveals that Durandal travelled to a planet 97 light years from the gravitational centre of the Milky Way. This strange planet's continents were mapped, and radioactive ruins of ancient cities were discovered, buried beneath the shifting sand and rock of a global desert. It turns out the Svet are the genetically engineered descendants of this dead world, named Lawan. Those on board Durandal's ship are in fact the first of their race to return to their ancestral home in a thousand years, to search through the devastation of an ancient war which resulted in their enslavement and to find ancient knowledge, or a weapon which they could use to turn the tide on the Four and prevent their galactic domination. All over the ship, dancing through the wreckage of the Four computer core, Durandal was laughing. And that is the story and lore of Bungie's first marathon game, Explained. But in the words of one of Bungie's other green cyborgs, I think we're just getting started. Similar to how Halo 2's story dwarfed Halo 1's in its complexity, its severity, and the stakes that it raised for the overall universe, the story of Marathon 2 Durandal does the exact same thing for the Marathon universe. I really hope you enjoyed this explainer of Marathon's story and lore. 
And trust me when I say you're going to want to make sure that you hit subscribe and ring that bell with notifications on so you don't miss my story and lore explanation video for Marathon 2 Durandal because trust me, the story hasn't even heated up yet. That story is insane. Video dropping very soon. So I want to give a huge thank you to all of my amazing patrons over there for the continued support as per usual. And thank you all so much for watching, especially if you've made it this far. I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you all in the next one.